road she traveled. Honoring women who made a difference. A Cooler Kids gift to our community. Welcome to a personal interview with Sister LeClaire Bears, conducted on April 26, 2006, by Alyssa. Okay. Um, do you want to start out with the you know, Chinese screening clinic? Yeah, right. Um, so did you start the clinic? Did you get the idea for it, or was it already open? Okay, and we're, now we're talking about the Indo-Chinese screening clinic. No, it was not open. Um, in 1983, the, there was an influx of refugees coming from Southeast Asia, and they were um, not all Hmongs. There were Hmongs, Cambodians, and there were some uh, Laotians and some uh, Thailand people. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, many people coming into the La Crosse area, and these people just kind of got here and the La Crosse County Health Department then was down on um, State, State Street which is now the Children's Center mm -hmm. and they didn't have any room there. They didn't have room to set up another clinic or anything and yet these, the, the, the people coming in were um, in need of some kind of help with health care where you could have an interpreter and other people that would reach out to them. So. Um, the health department uh, really was looking for help. So they asked both uh, Franciscan Scamp, it was then St. Francis Hospital and, and Gundr uh, Lutheran Hospital. And it was decided between them, they were working kind of jointly again, you know. And it was decided it was better if St. Francis could do it because um, there were many Hmong living right around in that area mm -hmm. of St. Francis Hospital, and they would be able to walk if they didn't have transportation, mm -hmm. which most of them didn't have in those days. So um, they were looking for a nurse to start the clinic. I was just resigning as a, an associate director of nursing at St. Francis because I had been doing administration for a long time, and I thought, mm, I don't want to live and die in administration. And um, so I was resigning from that position, and they asked me to do the um, to set up a, uh, a clinic for the poor, for the um, refugees who are also poor. But um, so um, they, I said, after some time, I said, well, I will do it. I was planning on leaving the La Crosse area, and, but. Um, I said, well, I'll do it for a, a year. I'll set it up and do it for a year. Well, 14 and a half years later, I closed it. <laughs> so you see, sometimes we don't do exactly what we think we're going to do yeah. because when we, and I liked it so much and I was so happy working with the refugees that I did not want to leave, okay? We to so uh, Julie Osborne, who was a registered nurse um, from the health department, and myself started that clinic, and it opened on February the 6th, I do believe, 1984. It was predicted that there were about 800 um, refugees in La Crosse would be by 1984. We saw over a thousand refugees our very first year in the clinic. Now we did not have a doctor there, so it was a it was a public health clinic sort of, in the public health department and and St. Francis did this together, so. There were two nurses and two interpreters. I had an interpreter in the clinic and Julie had one and she would go out to the homes and visit in the homes and, and acquaint the people with health care because see their, their health care in, in um, Laos, in the mountains where they lived, was very, very different. Mm -hmm. They didn't have clinics, they didn't have hospitals, so we needed to do a lot of teaching for them. And you know, and people were like, um, well, are you afraid? I said, afraid of what? Because in the schools, it was really a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. They were afraid of what are we going to catch from them? Mm -hmm. They didn't have anything to catch. <laughs> but people didn't know that because, you know, La Crosse was not used to people of color. You people are too young to remember that all yeah. coming in, but people in La Crosse did not have people of color here. So you're very, very blessed today that you have people of color that you are working with, living with, and going to school with. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a blessing for you. 
because when you leave La Crosse, you're going to be going to er uh, areas where there's going to be a lot of multicultural people. And if you've never had the experience, it's a shock to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shock to you. Mm -hmm. So, and one of the reasons why I was chosen to be the nurse to set up that clinic was because I had been on the island of Guam for a period of nine years. Mm -hmm. and. I worked there as the director of nurses, so during those nine years, we had many cultures come into Guam. That's cool. So I had worked with multicultural people, and I had, as the director of nurses, I worked with Filipinos, with Guamanians, which was the, indi the indigenous people of the island, and with people coming in from the trust territories and living there and working there. So I had a lot of experience with other cultures, which just has been a, the, one of the greatest blessings that I have ever received. So that's why when I talk about blessings, I talk about these blessings for you too, that, mm -hmm. that you have this opportunity in your young life to mm -hmm. live with them. So make the best of those things. And if you have friends that say, oh, what are they doing here? Then you remind them that these not the children t that you're going to school with, but their parents, grandparents, fought with the American soldiers in the Vietnam War. And so when the American soldiers left, the, the communists came into Laos and was punishing, killing people who helped the Americans. And so they only had one way to go. It was either die or come to America. Yeah. So we need to be re very respectful of the people that are here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, that was kind of a, a little history of, of how we started the clinic. So, the, so that was really the first, the first stage of their, of their medical care. Because when new people came into um, La Crosse, they came to the Indo-Chinese screening clinic first before they ever saw a doctor, unless they were ill, of course, and we saw that they got to the hospital or to the clinic. But otherwise, they came in, they would bring all their medical records from, from um, Southeast Asia with them, and most of them were uh, written on cardboard type paper. I mean, yeah. it was a uh, manila folder type paper, mm -hmm. that kind of type thing. And because of the rainy seasons over there and everything, a lot of them were rained on and were, you know, were not e easily readable. So we would go through all those records and find out if there was anything that was very important. Then we would take that out and send that to the to the uh, clinics where they would go. So then we would do a whole screening process. We do a, a physical on them. We mm -hmm. drew, drew blood and we. Um, check their their teeth, got them dental appointments, and then we would make appointments for them in um, one of the clinics, whichever clinic they chose. So it wasn't like, well, you have to go to St. Francis because St. Francis is housing this. No, we gave them the opportunity to go where they wanted to go. And most of them went wherever their relatives were going, so they, so they would uh, choose which clinic. Then we would send the, the um, the summary of the records as well as our own records. We would send a copy of that to the doctors that were going to take care of them. So they'd have all this information when they got them. Then also their immunizations, they did not get immunized. In the beginning there was hardly anybody that had any immunizations, but as time went on the camps were beginning to give immunizations, but they would send their records along and then we would update them and then we would make us a tickler file so that we could watch when they needed their next immunization and have them come in. Now through all this we had to do a lot of teaching mm -hmm. through our interpreters because we did not know the language and I'm one of the people that is not good at learning languages. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> I, I always say I have other gifts but to be bilingual is not one of my gifts. Mm -hmm. So, and I also encourage students when you're young and you have the opportunity to take another language, to take it. Because it's much easier to learn when you're young. And once you've learned one foreign language, another one becomes easier because there's, I don't know what it is about yeah. it, but that's what they tell me. I don't know that because so I they never. They tell me too. Yeah. So, 
it's important to do it when you're young and don't say, oh, when I get older, then I'll study. No, it, because when you get older, every year that you get older, it gets a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. So uh, use the opportunity, and if you're around some of the moms, learn some of the languages from them. Let them teach you. Uh, maybe many of them don't know the language anymore because they're st the younger ones aren't. Uh, unless their parents are really insisting on it and using it at home, then a lot of them don't know it anymore because they're speaking English, which which is the way it always goes. Did anything inspire you to become a nurse? or? Well, um, when I was a young young sister, when I went into the community, I went in, into the Franciscan Sisters in 1944. Mm -hmm. And I was going to Viterbo College my first year there, and then the second year in the, in the um, um, in our novice year, we did not go to classes except for theology. We didn't take um, um, basics, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. histories and Englishes and so forth. But we did a we did a career assessment test, and um, so the dean of the college said to me, would you like to be a nurse? And I said, well, that's what I really want to be. And so it's, in, in those days, they kind of told us what we were going to do. <laughs> now we have much more choice about it, but in those days, we, we didn't have the big, big choice. But I said, yes, I would like to be a nurse. So I went to Carroll, Iowa, to go into nurses training. Um, even though there was a school across the street at St. Francis, I did not go to that school. They, they sent me out to Carroll to go. And it was a small hospital, a 100-bed hospital, and they had a nursing school. And that's where I went. So I have been just most happy <laughs> that I have been a nurse. Um, do you have any stories that, you ha that happened during your career that you'd like to tell that you've never forgotten or anything? Um, I think some of the stories that I can think of are uh, what it meant to people when I would be taking care of their ch I, I, um, my, my specialty was pediatrics, which was care of the children, but I also did medical. When I was in Carroll, I had medical and pediatrics. When I went to Idaho Falls, I had surgical and pediatrics. Um, so, you know, I've had the combination many times, which I was always happy for because that, uh, that combination works very well. You could work with the little ones and then when you needed yeah. a little reprieve, you could go take care of the adults. And as a supervisor, I work both anyhow. Mm -hmm. But um, I think some of the things that I would, that I can think of as, that, as a nurse that was very um, important for me was to learn um, how people um, wanted to be loved and cared for. And I can think of, a, a, of mm -hmm. one I have found in my nursing career is that people want nurses who really know what they're doing, mm -hmm. but if they don't, you can know all the book work that you want, but if you don't have tender loving care, yeah. Yeah. then the patients are not happy. Um, I think that I have learned so many different times. I can think of one, uh, one patient uh, who I took care of back in Idaho, in Idaho Falls about, um, I, was in, I left Idaho Falls in 63. Mm -hmm. So that's a long time ago. And about two years ago, he found out where I lived and he wrote me a, a very passionate letter thanking me for the kind care I gave him. And he attributes his life to the fact that I cared for him, mm -hmm. that I knew what I was doing, that I did it, that I called the doctor at the right time, and that I also really cared about him, mm -hmm. not just cared for him, but cared about him. Mm -hmm. And um, I think many people that I have taken care of will say, you were a person that always cared about us that loved us and cared for us. Even though it was uh, difficult, some very, very ill patients um, sometimes are very demanding because they're very, very ill. Yeah. But that doesn't make the difference. I mean, you still be very kind and caring and loving to the patients, even if they kind of snap, <coughs> snap at us. Mm -hmm. We know that they're ill, and we know that that's something 
Yeah. Is there anyone? I know there's a lot of racist people, but do does anyone that try to like sway your opinion on what you wanted to become because they didn't like what you were doing? No, I never had anybody that tried to to change my mind about what I was doing. I think part of it was because I was always happy doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, and, and I had the philosophy that, you know, what I do, I want to do very well. And I want to, sh I want to show love in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And when, I think when we take that kind of a positive attitude, <clears throat> it comes through. Yeah. It comes through to people. So there was never any time that I felt um, that people were trying to tell me I should be doing something else. Yeah. Was there anybody you met along your career, like, along your life that you will never forget that maybe they helped you out or something? Well, I don't, did you people read the paper on Easter Sunday and you um, read about the sister that was, mm -hmm. was dying, mm -hmm. Sister Dominica Chen? She was, a, she came from China in 1936, 1936 I think she came and then went back to China in 1939 mm -hmm. and worked over in China. Then at, when the communists came, she was sent home because if, if they had stayed, they would have been punished, murdered, whatever. So the community had them come back home to the United States. And uh, in, 19, um, in the 1950s, she and I were in Idaho Falls together and we became very good friends. Mm -hmm. and we have, our friendship has been maintained all this time. Now she died April the 27th, and her funeral was Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, to me, uh, she was somebody that helped me, and I helped her. You know, and it was a, it was a, a really healthy friendship, a healthy friendship. And um, I've also had other friends. Uh, that I still maintain, even though I have left, like I've left Idaho, I've left the island of Guam, mm -hmm. um, I've left Carolina, well, where I was, and I still am in contact with some of those people. And I think that what I want to say is that uh, when we make friends, we need to be sure that we don't just ditch friends. Yeah. That friendships need to last. Now, the friendships are going to last in different stages. Some friends I can contact at Christmas time, and that's fine. Others I contact in between. Mm -hmm. And so um, friendship is a very important person, a, a very important part of our life. We really learn from friends. Uh, friendships must never be exclusive. So I like you, and because I like you, I can't like you. That's what I mean by exclusive. Mm -hmm. When we're friends, we need to be friends with the world, but then we can have special friends. Mm -hmm. Do you have any goals that you still want to accomplish with people, or anything that you want to open, or um, just want to get through? I want to continue to work with the poor, mm -hmm. and to help in any way that I can. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the reasons I feel like I was very anxious to come here today was to help you talk about, to learn about the poor yeah. and what it means to work with the poor and be accepting of the poor. Mm -hmm. Because we come from an affluent society and uh, I, I, what, what we don't ever want to do is to look down on the poor. We want to do what we can do to help the poor. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to continue to do. I want to continue to work as a volunteer. When you ask do I want to start anything else, Probably at my age, I don't have maybe the energy. Yeah. But if it was something that would not take too much energy, I would do it. Because I feel that I have administration skills. I have the skills of setting up different things. When I was in Guam, I uh, started an intensive care unit in a, a coronary care unit that they didn't have. I, I was the director of that. You know, I didn't do it personally because you can't do everything. But I saw to it that we got the nurses that would be able to do it. I sent them to Hawaii to get educated and then brought them back. Um, and I was the director of nurses in a, in a hospital, which was really, they just, nursing care was not what we would want it to be. 
And so it was a, it was a difficult task because um, many of the nurses were so trained that the doctor knew everything and even if they knew what was wrong they would do it. Mm -hmm. And so I taught them to say to the doctor, you know, this is not, you know, this is this and tell them more about the patient so that they could make better judgments about about yeah. care. Because the nurse knows so very much about patients because they're with them eight yeah. hours, you know, 24. And so, so um, I helped that. Uh, <coughs> starting the Indo-Chinese Screening Clinic was also a very important part of my life because it was helping people in need. And that's kind of where I am with my life. And um, St. Clair Health Mission, which I started in do you want to go into St. Clair Health Mission? Sure, sure, yeah. You got time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, St. Clair Health Mission started, I was still working in the Indo-Chinese Screening Clinic when we were working towards St. Clair. And it was like, um, I felt like I'm part of why that became about too, because I would talk to administration and say, you know, there's so many poor people. At that time, I was really talking about the Indo-Chinese people. I'd say there are so many people who are poor there um, because after they had been in the United States at that time, by the time they had been in the United States for eight months, they had and were over 18 years of age and not married with a family. Mm -hmm. And most, most of them were not married with a family at the age of 18. Mm -hmm. They would um, have to take care of themselves. They could get no longer get any kind of government help. Mm -hmm. There was no help for them health-wise. There was no cash assistance for them. So their family had, to, you know, to the, the family, it was one person that they were not receiving any kind of income for. So if they would get sick, there was no help for them, no financial help. And the, and, and the families were very, very poor because at that time they had not already had jobs because in eight months that meant you had to learn the language, you had to learn the culture, you had to finish school and learn to take care of yourself. Well, you can't do that in eight months. I know that <laughs> because I've experienced being in China for four months and I, I had to have a lot of help to help me. You know? And of course I wasn't in the situation where I wasn't being paid because I was being paid so I could take care of myself. So um, anyhow, I was talking with the administrator. Then we talked more about it and said, there's a lot of people in the cross area that are poor and are not receiving health care. When we first talked about it, people said, oh, that's not true. Because you know, um, the, the old thought about poor people are the people that are sleeping on the church steps and sleeping in the parks and sleeping here. Well, there's many poor people that are not sleeping in the parks or sleeping, but there are also poor people that are sleeping in the parks, that are sleeping on the parking ramps, that are sleeping under the bridges, winter and summer, and um, are not able to get health care. So we finally um, said, well, let's, let's do a study. So we had a student, his name was Jeff Woody, I think, from the University. He was doing an internship at St. Francis at that time in, in public relations. So they had him do the study, found out that there were 10,000 people in La Crosse County, which is about 100,000 people, that would qualify for health care in a free clinic if it was available, if they were sick. Now doesn't that kind of just widen your mind, 10,000 people? That's one tenth of the people in the cross area, mm -hmm. in the county of La Crosse, of a hundred thousand people who are not receiving health care wow. because they can't afford it. So they don't go get health care until it's so crucial. Then they would go to the emergency room. We took care of a lady the very first month I was there who had cancer so bad that she died in four months, but had never been to a doctor to be diagnosed. Wow. And she died in four months because her cancer was so advanced when she first came to our mission. So anyhow, we, we did this study and then we, we decided that we would 
um, like to open a, a clinic. So we, um, that committee wrote to um, the four the four health places because in that in that time there was St. Francis Hospital, there was Skim Clinic, there was Gunderson Clinic and Lutheran Hospital. Now it's Franciscan Skim and Gunderson Lutheran. So there's two entities. But at that time we wrote to all four and asked them if they would help sponsor the um, a free clinic if there was one that started here. So they all wrote back and said yes they would which says a lot about our people in the cross yeah. and how they care, you know. And so the sponsors of St. Clair Health Mission are Franciscan Skim and Gunderson Luther. They do that jointly. And um, so then we, we, we wrote letters and asked to the doctors, to the nurses, and asked for volunteers. And when we opened St. Clair Health Mission um, in 1993, we had 150 volunteers listed. That was uh, uh, people for the lab, for social workers, for um, nurses, for receptionists. And later on, we, we added pharmacies, so we have pharmacists that are volunteering there. Um, so, you know, I felt proud of the people of La Crosse because without that, you know, I know I got a lot of honors. You probably have seen my name yeah. in the paper. And I've had lots of honors. But I always say, there's always somebody that gets the honors, but there's other people doing the work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's the way life is, too. And, and it's very humiliating to be called and say, you know, we're going to give you this honor for what you're doing. Because I think of all the people that yeah. need the honor. And, and whenever I give an acceptance speech, I make sure that I say, you know, I'm receiving the honor, but the honor is for the volunteers. Mm -hmm. The honors are for whoever the, whoever is involved in whatever I'm getting it for. Mm -hmm. Because that's an important thing, is to recognize who the people really are making the, mm -hmm. the thing go. Mm -hmm. So that started in 1993. And because I was the director of the Indo-Chinese Screening Clinic, I didn't know if I could really, truly do both clinics. But they asked me if I would like to do that. And I said, I'll try it. And if it works, it works. So I did. And so I did both clinics for five years. Because in 1998, we closed the Indo-Chinese Screening Clinic because there were no new refugees coming into La Crosse. There were refugees coming in and out who had already been here and who had been into the healthcare systems, but no new ones. Well, now, this past year, a whole group of new ones came in, but the health department was able to take care of them then. So we didn't have to reopen the Indo-Chinese Screening Clinic. But during that time, we saw and took care of over 4,000 people from, no, that was the refugees, excuse me. Um, um, in St. Clair Health Mission, I, ran, I was director of St. Clair Health Mission until I retired in 2003. That was 10 years after we had opened it. And we saw almost, almost 10,000 people by that time in 10 years. It was 9,000 plus. So you see, and they aren't all just people that come in once. Some of the people have been coming to St. Clair Health Mission since we opened it in 1993 because they have never been able to get out of the poverty situation and have never, some of them can't get a job because of their health poor health, mm -hmm. so they keep coming there. Now, about, uh, let's see, that was 2000, I think it was in 2001, um, Sandy Brecky, who was a, a volunteer at the clinic. I think her son goes here. Her son goes here. Yep. That's right. Andrew. Yep. Yes. They're very good friends of mine, mm -hmm. the whole family. So um, when you see Andrew, you tell him hello for me. Okay. All right. And. Um, so Sandy suggested that we open the clinic for people with chronic disease entities uh, like diabetes, mm -hmm. cardiacs, hypertensions, and so forth, because they needed more consistent care than we could give at night. Yeah. Because see, at night, um, there's a different doctor every night. So if they come in this week, 
they have one doctor. If they come in next week, they have another doctor that yep. takes care of them. So there's not the same consistency that the people with chronic disease entities need. So, the, so she, I said, Sandy, you can do it. I can't do it. If you feel like you can open that clinic on the Wednesdays. So she volunteered to set it up. And by that time, we had uh, expanded our clinic from four rooms to eight rooms because TriQuest uh, did their, um, their TriQuest tourney that they do every year, and they gave us the money one year, which was like <laughs> So um, we, um, so Sandy opened that clinic, and it has just grown so much that um, there is busy in the in the daytime with appointed people. She told me the other day when I was talking to her, she said we could have two day clinics, one for just for the people with diabetes, mm -hmm. because there's so many of them that are coming in and being taken care of. But it's, 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 it's just expanded so that they have um, somebody that comes in and does foot care, somebody comes in and does um, education. There's um, dietitians, volunteer dietitians. All of these people are volunteers except the two co-directors who are Sandy Breggy and Rebecca Nessie. Mm -hmm. And they come in, they volunteer on Wednesday to do diabetic teaching and teaching for coronaries. They're, so they're, they've still got everybody that, with a chronic disease entity coming in. And I don't know if they'll ever be able to open it another day or not, but she would like to open it. So they'd have one day for diabetics. And these are only people with appointments, and they have to be patients from St. Clair Health Mission so that they have been in in the nighttime, and then they'll make an appointment for them in the daytime. And again, we have three physicians on Wednesdays. There's a, a Dr. Um, Garrity from Pardashin, who is a retired physician who comes up here every Wednesday to be part of their volunteer staff. Mm -hmm. And then Family Practice Clinic, Family Health Clinic, which are the fa Family Practice Residents, mm -hmm. uh, cover as one doctor, and then they have a preceptor. So the preceptor can be a different person, but they take a track and they do it every day, every Wednesday for a period of time. And so um, there's much more continuity in the care that they are getting. And then they make consistent appointments for them to return when they need to return. So it's just like a, a, an ordinary clinic, except that it's run by volunteers. Yeah. And so they have seen, now let's see, they've been six years. I think that they're into the, 12,000 people that have come through the clinic, plus all those daytime people that keep oh, yeah. returning. So it's been a wonderful, to me, it's one of the, probably one of the highlights of my life yeah. was to um, be able to uh, establish and run St. Clair Health Mission for 10 years. Because um, when I came to the convent, one of my missions was I wanted to care for the poor. That's what I wanted to do. And as a nurse, you you know, we, we always had poor that we were taking care of. This podcast brought to you from across Wisconsin by the Kula Kids at Longfellow Middle School in conjunction with the League of Women Voters.